It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. I spent the afternoon uh, touring a few of the uh, colleges here at the University of California at Riverside. I uh, started off uh, the day in, uh, where's Elizabeth? Uh, I, I, I just want to thank Elizabeth for extraordinary hospitality. Uh, spent uh, lunch with uh, Dean Deese from the medical school. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, one of my appointing authorities is I can appoint somebody to the serum board, which is the stem cell uh, financing research authority for the state of California by virtue of the voters of the state of California. Uh, so she's enjoying that service, but the hopes and aspirations uh, that the dean has for the medical school, what the medical students are going to do, and then uh, shortly thereafter met three of the inaugural class of the medical school. Uh, just really impressive uh, future doctors. Uh, I am just so hopeful. Uh, just And you look at the extraordinary diverse backgrounds and the contributions that they're going to make, uh, hopefully returning to this community or elsewhere where we're underserved uh, in so many and various communities throughout the state of California. Uh, so very, very exciting. Uh, then uh, spent uh, some time at CSERT. Uh, just to look at the incredible blend of research, uh, practical applications, uh, impacting public policy, the environment, uh, this regional community, and what California is going to look uh, to. And then I have dear friend Stan Stosel here with the IBW. So right, you get that cross section with individuals who are in this room, uh, represented workers, and what it means uh, to everyday Californians. Uh, then spent time with. Uh, the uh, Kim Wilcox, uh, and I just loved the message of leadership that he was talking to, right? The, uh, he was just a nonstop quoting, and he wasn't trying to uh, quote machine about his vision uh, for UC Riverside, right? Aspiring to greatness, about the diversity, about wide reaches. Uh, for me, that's especially important. Uh, as the professor mentioned, uh, my parents are immigrants uh, to this country. My dad came to this country with three shirts, two pairs of pants. Uh, English was his fifth lesson, but the, it's sort of this reminder, when he came to this country, uh, he came here because America is the best place to get an education. And they, he knew what an education would mean for his future opportunities. And my mom did the same thing. So it's, it's absolutely great that you have people come to this community listening to those medical students, one whose parents were immigrants from Panama, the other one whose uh, mom was an immigrant from uh, Guatemala, the other one who's an immigrant from Vietnam, right? It's just America, generation after generation, Germans, Irish, Italians, uh, you know, Mexican-Americans, Middle Easterners, Jews, Christians, uh, those who are atheists uh, that create all of this. So that's why it's a great privilege to be with all of you and to live today th living the promise your motto at UC Riverside today. Uh, for those of us who are in public policy, what a gift uh, and what a gift that all of you have, right? You have a le living, breathing organism that's taking place here. What you used to hear from those of us uh, in elected office, right, those who studied government and public policy is that, you know, you have what happens in the classroom and then you have what happens in real life, right? And often two, oftentimes the two never meet. That's not what's happening here in UC Riverside. Right? As I mentioned my day, you have built that bridge, you have built that intersection so it operates at a high performing level here at the University of California Riverside. And I think one of the great attributes of uh, UC Riverside is, as I just pointed out, is that you're not doing things just strictly in a clinical sense. Right? You understand the time, the place, the conditions in which we all oper operate. And this is absolutely critical today in the oper operations of state government here in California because we have to make sure that we match what's happening across this globe, what's happening in the 21st century. Oh, and then I see Nicole. Nicole, if you want to raise your hand. Nicole was kind enough to give me the tour at CSER, which was absolutely uh, incredible. And so if we want to be California for the future and to understand where we are, let's just remember a few short years ago, California financially was in decline. Our economy was in great decline. Uh, when I was in your previous position, the state controller, and for those of you who aren't familiar with what the state controller does, I was the state's chief fiscal officer. Our economy 
was the world's eighth largest economy prior to the recession, and then we fell to the world's 12th largest economy. Today, we're number six. We're number six, but we want to make sure that, <laughs> that we get to a much better place. And if we're going to get to a much better place, it starts like and continues here, where you have the UC Riverside and its extraordinary diversity and reflecting the world. Right? We have to celebrate that this spot, America and its freedoms it offers, the people who come here, right, are on the same page, right? Because we all want to live our dreams. And UC Riverside gets it better than most, and that we have to come together to work together to create diversity and by ultimately creating the success that's really critical. And what I love is that your brand is increasing dramatically. In my field, you just see regionally terrific elected officials, whether it's Assembly Member Jose Medina, a really decent former uh, veteran, and now your representative, Paul Cook, uh, former Assembly Member Manuel Perez, and our great, my dear friend, and our great speaker, Speaker Rendon. Um, one of the things I hope you do is that you'll have the speaker come here and meet with the students, right? Imagine where you're seated, seated today and imagine where you could be in the future, right? You can be anything you want to be, right? You can be the next speaker, Anthony Rendon, who comes from here. You can be a Nobel Prize winner. You can be the, an academic, you can be a chancellor of a university. That's what all of this provides to all of, all of you. Now, why do I say that? Because when I was speaking with, the, with, the, with your chancellor, but he was just talking about the academic achievements across the spectrum. Right? We have so much inequality in regards to achievements uh, through different ethnicity, ethnicities, through different backgrounds. And UC Riverside is the antidote to all of that. Right? There's this old Harvard study that has, if you take a child from a low-income community and you put them in a high-income community, and really, that it's not that high income, it's a high opportunity community. That child, despite origin, despite background, despite wealth, achieves nearly as well as the very wealthy community. And your model, your operations here, are making that dream come <coughs> true, right? Where Latinos, or African Americans, or Caucasians, or Asians, are all performing at the same level. Like that's, that's the excitement about our future. And so that's why I'm extraordinarily supportive of what the students are doing here, what the faculty is doing here, what the leadership is doing here. And the fact is that you're receiving national and international recognition on that particular front. I, as a public policy maker, have tried to support a lot of that, right? Because not only do I want that happening here, I want to see that across the globe. So by virtue of my position as a state treasurer, and some of you don't understand a lot of the work that I do, I'm your state's banker. Uh, as, uh, as pointed out, the, uh, you know, I, ch I process $2 trillion worth of transactions each day, including a lot of your money. I invest your money on a daily basis. So when it said I invest 65 to $75 billion a day, Right? That's what we're doing. I'm trying to make sure that we get the maximum return on those dollars so that we can come back and invest uh, in your education. I'm the agent of sale for your debt. Right? We operate with the University of California. So we've worked very hard to make sure instead of wasting our dollars because we had a poor credit rating, that we could close that gap. Now, I think many of you will understand, uh, for the students here in this room, how many of you have student loan debt? Right, most of you, Thea. So, state of California, when we don't handle our finances well, unfortunately, uh, on your shoulders, you carry that burden. And when we had those two recessions during the past decade and a half, we had to increase tuition and fees that you pay by over 113%. In addition, right, our credit rating just tanked. We were very close to junk bond status in the state of California. When I was your controller, I was able to keep us out of junk bond status, but because we've improved our economy, because we've improved our finances, we've been able to, in the treasurer's office, pay lower interest rates 
for the monies that the University of California borrows and all of California borrows. So you just imagine this, let's say your student loans today were 8% and you had, or somebody has good credit and it was 8%, but because California had a bad credit rating, we were paying 9.71%, 171 basis points more. Last year we had it down to 19 basis points. The economy's a little wobbly today, so it's up to 35 basis points. But as your state treasurer, I have saved us 5.3 billion dollars in my first two years and two months as your banker so that we have more money so that the legislators can decide to put more money into higher education as they're starting to do, to put more money into K through 12 education because all of you who are in these public policy classes in taking economics knows the number one thing, <coughs> the most important thing to have a, a thriving economy is to have human capital, right? Is to make sure that you get the best knowledge, the best skill set, to have the best talent possible so that you perform and that you optimize your lives. And when we optimize your abilities, your happiness, the rest of our communities, the rest of this state and our humanity performs very well. And so as I mentioned, Nicole was kind enough and she helped us tour the Center for Environmental Research and Technology, which has entered a new era of research and partnership with the California Air Resources Board. Right? And the work that the California Air Resources Board and the, the research that you're doing here is gonna have worldwide implications. Uh, we know that despite what's happening in Washington, D.C., California has been an outlier for some period of time. And so back a few years ago when we had a different presidential administration prior to President Obama's administration, we had some of the same concerns. But people from throughout the globe, globe look to the state of California. I actually had the good fortune of going to Prince Charles' residence because Prince Charles was leading an effort called the P-8 where he wanted eight of the largest public pension plans in the world to come together to address strategies, tactics, <coughs> policies regarding global climactic disruption. And so I'm sure that that will continue to unfold because they want to look to some place and California is that beacon of hope as we have always been. This relationship between the university and the state will become a powerful example of sustainable research and policy making with far reaching impacts. It is another example of this university as a living laboratory with multiple deep connections to the community and larger world. This research stands out to potentially help address the environmental and health needs of the people in this region, in this state, and everywhere else who are exposed to pollution and suffer from historically high respiratory incidences. I live nearby in Torrance, California. We know that Los Angeles used to be the most polluted city in the United States of America, right? And even though it has still, and has made dramatic progress, right, just so up until recently, we know that 5,400 Angelinos still face deep respiratory issues that aren't near, uh, not necessarily fatal, but near fatal. And so this progress, this research is absolutely critical. And so that's why this is a special place and this is why all of you should have, feel incredibly grateful that what, of what you're doing in regards to here. And this is where I like the blend in regards to making sure that you have wise public policy making uh, in this region. Presidential orders, tweets, alternative facts tumble pell-mell out of Washington, D.C. today. The principles and values that we as Californians cherish are in their crosshairs, right? And it's okay that they have their values. I wanna make sure that we have our values heard and addressed, right? Because this is in America. We are entitled to our speech. We are entitled to our dreams, uh, but I don't want us not to be heard and not to make sure that people understand how we feel and how we're gonna act. One of the things that I am especially concerned about, especially I see all the young faces in this room because I mentioned a little bit about the economics and the circumstances by which my family came, is that immediately in Washington, D.C., they went after a dignified retirement for seniors uh, in this state. And as I look at so many of you, the young people, unless we change things dramatically, twice the number of you will retire into, if you can retire, 
into retirement insecurity relative to your parents and grandparents. So those ages 25 to 44 will be twice as vulnerable as those 45 to 64. So over the past few years, I have worked aggressively to try to have California innovate a program that our Senate President Pro Tem introduced to try to create new options for the 7.5 million California workers who work but whose employers don't provide a pension plan. We moved and made significant progress back in Washington, D.C. The Senate President Pro Tem and I went to Speaker Pelosi's office multiple times, met with uh, our uh, representatives or with our senators, met with members of uh, Congress on both sides of the aisle, and, res and responded to some of the private sector concerns here in California. We made dramatic progress. That Department of Labor rule was instituted, but with the new administration, they wanted to retract that rule. And so we lost that vote in the United States House of Representatives. We are hanging on in the United States Senate. But that's one way we were pushing aggressively because you, even though you may not imagine it now, deserve, after all your hard years of work, to retire that gives you dignity and decency and a true fulfillment and meaning in life. And so, thank you. So that's an instance of where we resist. But I think it's important that we understand that resistance is very narrow, right? It's a reactive agenda. It's an abandonment of our greatest hopes and dreams. It cites too much to others, right? As I toured today, what I love is watching the freedoms, right? Watching, the, watching all of you, watching what you want to do, right? I want you to spread your wings and fly Right, to get to the place that you imagine. That's the best thing about America. So we should embrace, as Californians and as Americans, our, our, our legacy. Right? This is a place where we are the cradle of imagination, of economic innovation, of upward social mobility, of trailblazing ideas. Right? And we want to celebrate what's happening with what's regional to each of our communities. So here you have that mix, right? The, what was, you got, I just met with the uh, Dean, the, what's, Dean Catherine Elizabeth Lessig? Yurik. Yurik. I'm sorry? Dean Yurik. Dean Yurik, right? The, uh, so she was talking about here the, in uh, their, uh, the, with um, um, the trees, right? The, uh, this is the only place where you have four of every citrus harvest trees uh, on this planet. Right, and how this is a place where people come here. So you think about the founding of our economics. It's the agrarian society. And then you move to a manufacturing society. And then you go to where CSERT is, right, and you have this incredible technology. Right, and then you marry all of that together. You have all of that in this university across the platforms. Right, so we should play to those strengths. We should play to your advantages here. You should play to the imagination and the talents of the people, and not Washington. what Washington, D.C., what the Beltway says you need to do. So I think you are doing today is what America needs to see. You're tr truly showing how America is great. And so we want to lead by not only making sure that we do this innovation, but pro providing a strong moral compass, an economic compass about who we are, about paying people strong, vibrant wages, making sure that we have that expectation where every Californian is going to get a dignified retirement, that they're going to have access, once again, to affordable college tuition, and that we can, again, for the young people and others, provide affordable housing. As your state treasurer, right, I want to keep you in this state. Right? We've invested a lot in your promise. But when we just look at the economic numbers, uh, yesterday I did a pr press conference because I sponsored legislation, right? My great staff was coming up with ideas. With your debt, don't you want some help to when you have a chance to refinance that student debt to lower interest rates? Wouldn't you take, want to take some of those student interest rates down from eight to six, whatever figure you can, right? So that was the legislation that emanated out of my legislative idea that emanated 
out of my office into <coughs> the bill that Senator Ben Allen is carrying for all of us, right? And then after you graduate, I want to make sure that we try to help you take down that debt as quickly as possible so that we can find you housing, right? And a decent job to cover your housing. So if California doesn't do this right, you're gone, and we don't have a great future. We're a million and a half units short here in the state of California, and our best and brightest oftentimes are leaving. And I want to show that, that we can do this accepting who we are, right? This ought to be a state of, I know there's people who use the word tolerance, but I want one that this is a state that is a state of understanding, state of support, and a state of love, right? Because I think that's how we operate at our highest in our particular humanity. So as Californians, and we have on these particular fronts, we will resist when we have to, and we will lead in most other instances, right? I think we have to change that frame of mentality. So if they want to challenge us on access for hardworking, low-income individuals who want health care, we have to say, in California, we're better than that. When we have individuals in California have a pre-existing illness, we have to say we don't accept what's happening in Washington, D.C. When we say we have a young person who deserves coverage as they exist prior to up to the age of 26, you deserve access to health care coverage. That's what we need to do. So your voices, right, from this institution to higher levels needs to be heard, right, because it is your voice, it is your participation that's going to transform the way they think in Washington, D.C. And then what I'm excited about, and again, C-CERT matching your generation is the millennial generation values the environment twice as much as the older generations. And so over this next few decades, we're going to have a transfer of wealth of at least $30 trillion to younger folks. And so as you have that transfer of money, I'm trying to create funding apparatuses so that we can have a clean environment, clean energy sources, clean water, clean environment. And so I'm pushing a national effort in, the, in our country to have more green bonds. Right? We know that the things that we want to do to upgrade oftentimes can be costly and out of reach. So in the Treasurer's Office, we've worked very aggressively to try to create a mature market where people feel comfortable investing in the green space. We have to resist what we've seen in the past, right? Because we have still in Washington an administration that denies that climate change exists. About 10 years ago, as the former state controller, I went down to an ExxonMobil shareholder meeting and that we know they helped deny climate change and I said, that's not real, right? We know that science is not real. We have to, first of all, believe in science before we make our public policy decision makings. And so that's why I think it's important that we start to bring the alternatives. Because if we don't, we're going to have dire <coughs> environmental crisis faced by this earth, right? If we have a two degree increase centigrade uh, on this planet, we're going to have dramatic health impacts, respiratory impacts, change in the environment, Right, you have a two degree centigrade increase in Asia, you're going to see massive snow melt, and you're going to have a billion and a half Asians who are going to be at great physical harm and risk because changing water patterns and other types of patterns. So it's important that we make that progress of the Paris Accord that we witnessed where 200 nations joined and that we have to keep up in that particular regard. So what do people believe what are people to believe? What public policies do they expect? And what do they think about the science of all of this? You are helping to lead that charge. Now, one of your instructors here is, is in our community exemplifying the answer to this question. Mary Drozer is her name. Uh, I hope many of you are familiar with her work. She's a professor of geology and doing incredible important work on climate change. The, her research is also practical in many aspects and it impacts the community. In one way, she describes her work as bridging the gap between the scientists and understanding and what communities and citizens need to know. 
She does this by going into the Riverside community to work with students ranging from grade school to through high school. And she says, once you understand climate change that can make a difference, it will inspire behavioral change and hopefully we can all make better changes, such as turning off the light when we leave a room, shopping locally, and making sensible choices when buying a car. Together, these differences do matter. You see, Riverside has had, had a science fair mentorship program in which undergraduate and graduate students serve as mentors to help kids in grades six through 11 complete science projects on climate change. And what Professor Drozer, Drozer and UC Riverside students are doing is connecting the dots. I think it's really important so that it doesn't become foreign to people between personal decision making, public policy making, and the scientific research upon which our very real climate change exists. Climate change policy, along with education, including easing student debt and addressing affordable housing, as I mentioned, are my top priorities. The climate change policies I oversee include, again, what Nicole and others are doing, looking at a particulate matter. I help finance the upgrades of 10,000 diesel fuel trucks to cleaner technology. Uh, what I especially enjoyed is the, uh, as I was sharing with uh, Chancellor Wilcox, so I'm gonna take that, right? We do a lot of those studies, but she was talking about the elements where you're talking about hopefully cleaning the environment, but when it interacts uh, with matter and the environment, sometimes it has negative impacts. So I have to make sure that my staff is vetting that research on the back end and not just looking at what some of the advocates are bringing towards on the front ends. Another program that those of you who are involved uh, in this space, I chair a few economic development authorities. I chair 15 economic development authorities. One of them is the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority. We're trying to build projects uh, to create incentivized things uh, such as uh, energy projects, uh, new types of transportation, which have strong environmental benefits but also grow the economy. And then one of the things that we just started opening up is that we started financing EV charging stations. One half of 1% of the cars are electrical vehicle today in, in the state of California. If we're gonna meet a lot of our ambitious goals and meeting our uh, legislation that has passed uh, SB 350 and other things, we have to make sure that we provide the opportunities for the EV uh, cars to grow and flourish, right? A lot of people won't purchase it because of its limited range. So we have to build out that infrastructure to take advantage of those opportunities. And in fact, our goal is to have 100,000 EV charging stations throughout the state of California. So this is some of the particular focus that we're engaged in in the treasurer's office based on a lot of the work that you're doing today at UC Riverside. And then one of the things that I started to mention is that I think it's really important we understand the impact of the green bonds across the great globe. Uh, this market has grown to $118 billion. But it's absolutely amazing that America lags the rest of the world in this particular space. Right? Europe has had it well developed. Asia, China is the fastest growing market. Latin America has surpassed the United States. We need to look at what people are doing in Germany. We need to look at what people are doing in the Netherlands. We have to look at what people are doing in France to make sure that we can change our particular practices. And so when you engage, right, because you will engage with diverse leaders, right? This world is very different and that our leaders can come much closer together at any moment's time. So when you accept the leadership, right, as a, a local, city council member, or a county supervisor, or as a state elected official, right? By virtue of that position, your experience and your decision making will oftentimes have a worldwide impact. So that's a conversation that is different than we, what we have witnessed in the past. And that's why I'm very hopeful, and that's why I was very excited to spend so much of my time today with all of you. And so, with all of this, I just want you to understand the blessings 
that you, this university affords to all of you. I want this lesson not to be lost, to capture an important life lesson. My mom shared with me, uh, I mentioned she was immigrant stock, right, and I, I sometimes challenge my mom, said, Mom, what do, you, what do you know? But growing up, my mom said, pick great friends. Pick great friends, right? And so you learn those lessons academically here, right? Whether it's sociology, whether it's economics, whether it's organizational management, the people in your life affect your access to information. They impact your access to happiness. They access your, your status in regards to your financial well-being. So fully embrace this opportunity that you have here at U UC Riverside. And most of all, I look forward to all of you uh, when I'm the oldest child uh, and I was named after John F. Kennedy. And my mom uh, was inspired as many immigrant parents are by whoever's holding the office at that particular time. So what resonated with me from President Kennedy's inaugural speeches is he said, to each generation a torch is passed. You know, sooner than you think, sooner than you believe, you will be the leaders of this country. And then he also said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Right? I, I think America at its very best is at its best when people think not just of themselves, but how they can build something special. And so with that, I conclude, but more importantly, I'm very excited about our future together because I think our greatest promise is one that uh, we don't even hold in our imagination yet because we will far surpass it. Thank you very much. And yeah, let's, and yeah, let's walk. So let's mingle more and uh, get some questions. So I have I have a question already, kind of trying to, to think about, especially in the context of this um, administration and with with Pruitt in particular, has been very skeptical about uh, green technology and green jobs. So what's your sense of what, um, especially with the federal regulatory climate that might not be as friendly uh, towards green energy? What can what can California do to continue to push innovations uh, in the green sector? So as I started to mention, and everybody heard the question, correct? Yeah. So the, uh, as, as, as mentioned, one of the efforts that I've tried to push is uh, green bonds, right? Because we're gonna have to look at various financing tools, but we're also trying to find friends from the rest of the world. I referenced mm -hmm. Prince Charles. So I am hosting an international green bond conference in partnership with the Milken Institute and a, a British environmental publication. We're rereaching out to uh, and uh, leaders from China, we're reaching out to leaders from Canada, uh, we, we're reaching out to leaders from throughout the world to participate in this gathering because they, they understand this and they're very excited and they're trying to figure out how do they can get the highest representation from their government participating in all of this. Right? And so I think once you, can, once you start a channel, once you start a roadway of success, right, most mainstream institutions will move along that pathway. Right? Our, Washington DC can continue to say we're not gonna participate, but if you have massive investment by the private sector, if you have financial <coughs> capital going that way, if you have academic research that's uh, thriving, and, right, and you create thriving environments, we can move. Obviously we would flourish more if we had Washington DC support, but we can still move forward. Sounds good. Um, so uh, we're opening to questions from the audience. Um, so if you have a question, please identify yourself. Uh, any relevant connection you have either to UC Riverside or the, or the region uh, more generally. Um, and so, yeah, opening it up. And then I always ask, introduce yourself, but you also have to share with everybody what your dream is. Wow, okay. Uh, no pressure, uh, okay. Hands go back to hand. <laughs> okay, um, do you have an answer, a question for what your dream is before you ask your question, I guess? You guys share everybody your name and your group. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Um, hi, my name is Joy Chen. I am a fourth year public policy student. Um, and my dream is to hopefully become an editor. Oh, excellent. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> What's the most important thing you learned while you're at UC Riverside? Uh, 
I think it's kind of the importance of community organizing. Um, I think that a lot of students here at UCR <coughs> place a lot of emphasis in community, and because it's kind of all you have here, um, because we are, you know, one of the most diverse schools um, in the nation, and so I think it's just kind of believing in the power of the people and believing that we can make a lot of change um, by uh, gathering a lot together. That's fantastic. Good. So what's your question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're ready for that Senate run right now? <laughs> um, so my question is, across the board, um, or from what I've experienced, AAPIs have a relatively low political participation, especially voter participation. Um, what are some tips that you could give, or what do you, what are the initiatives that you would think of to kind of increase political participation among um, AAPIs? So a AAPIs are Asian American Pacific Islanders. So back to your response, you need community organizing. Like the, the so for a lot of uh, Asians, uh, especially those tied to uh, recent immigration, there's there's concern about because frankly they were discouraged from participating in the particular process. Right, the, my my mom being an immigrant, she wanted me to follow the route of immigrants from Taiwan. Right, she wanted her four kids to be surgeons. <laughs> and so I stand before you as the failed oldest son. <laughs> the, but in my childhood, we were discriminated against, and the, I was inspired by Martin Luther King and uh, Thurgood Marshall, and I saw public policy, I saw law as a way to change the world. Right? I wake up feeling incredibly blessed because basically the, I get to try to help you every day. Right? I get paid, and I can get rich, uh, but I get paid to try to make your lives better. I absolutely love it, right? And then, frankly, I meet all of you, and I meet other people that otherwise I never would have have met. And being a child when you're discriminated, is like you're excluded from the process. So we have to show that, you know, this this is a country, this is a federal democratic republic governed by the rule of law. And so everybody's participation is important to make the rule of law so society supports everybody's success. And so. They're not going to do as well, but more importantly, not as more importantly, just as importantly, everybody isn't going to do as well unless we can get a society where people buy in, right? And especially today, that community organizing is really important because people have lost trust, right? If you look at the, it's been, right, and the professor knows it better than I, over the last couple of decades, right, our civic engagement and people's trust numbers have dropped dramatically. And so how do we bring people once again to believing in each other. And so you have to work together, you have to play together. Uh, and, right, and I operate in that world. It, it is hard to lead if people don't believe uh, that you're gonna try to act in their best interest. So I try to build strong institutions across the board. Yes. Hi, my name is Nelson Goins. I'm from San Bernardino, work in politics. Very good. Since I was about 19. And then who, who have you worked for? I've uh, worked for Congressman Aguilar, Toronto. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things I want to push in, if you should feel encouraged, the I've always tried to push financial education for elected officials, especially in San Bernardino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said it. <laughs> the uh, right because you could be really bright, right? And we all, if here's one of the life lessons that I learned late: if you need help, ask for help, right? The uh, the, some of those lessons where we used to challenge mom and dad, right? It's like, what do they know? Well, they live through it, right? A whole bunch of other people know. So put, as my mom, the great people in your life. But you'll have really bright people. You'll get a great education here. But right when you're the mayor of San Bernardino, unless somehow you have this, this different backup or you work for us, right? You have to know cash flow. You have to know budgetary math. You have to know urban planning. You have to know civil engineering. Right? You have to know actual urban math. Right? You'll have to know all these other things. And it's hard to accumulate all that information, right? So the, uh, the, to the extent that you run later on, we're trying to set up financial education for local elected officials that you should take advantage of. Um, and with that, it's actually um, sort of the Inland Empire families. What do you think about SB1 and the fact that the Inland Empire families are going to have to drive to commute to LA and Orange County, which unfortunately falls on us? Um, SB1 is a gas tax. So that's what we're for. Yeah, the, uh, th that's hard. That's, that's, that's hard for middle-income and low-income workers, but we need to invest in our infrastructure, right? That's one of those just tough choices. This state is not going to thrive unless, right, what you learn from your basic economics lesson. You have to have the best 
talent available, you have to have the money available, and you have to have great infrastructure. And so this is one of the state, right, that when we put in that 18 cent tax for infrastructure, you know, a long time ago, right, today if we were just you know, adjusting that for today, you know, it's like north of 50 cents. Uh, equivalent, right? Because you know your inflation and you know the value of the dollar and the fact that over a period of time, the value of that dollar drops. So the, we can't, we, ha we, we have to have that tax to make sure that we can upgrade our infrastructure. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Jesus Martinez. I'm a policy major. What's your first name? Jesus. Okay. Um, I'm a policy major. Um, I'm really interested in being a. Did you say policy or philosophy? <laughs> philosophy. 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 <laughs> I get my influence from uh, Plato's Republic, and one of the quotes that says, uh, and so kings are philosophers, or philosopher kings, and the cities will know peace. And so um, I'm interested in knowing- Did you learn that in high school or in college? Both. <laughs> <laughs> Good so to you. My question is, um, of what use would a law degree have? Um, it would it be useful or necessary to have a hold a position in politics or in government? You should do whatever you're passionate about. The, uh, the, so a law degree will help, but if you want to do a law degree strictly to get into politics, right, unless the, uh, right, it, it will certainly enhance you, but that's not the only, t that's, right, that doesn't have to be the only tool you have in a toolkit. And then as much as the, I support people going to law school, right, the, uh, it's expensive, right, it's, it's a, expensive, so the, the uh, Right, so you have, uh, well, and I obviously you want to pursue scholarships and everything else, but if, if you're going to be good in public <coughs> policy, right, the, you just, you just want to pick up, you know, a wide range of skill sets. You want to be able to speak, you want to be able to write, you, you, you want some technical background, uh, but you can, you can learn the, the legal aspects, right, you're not going to be as good as somebody who went to three years of law school and practice. But you, you can you can foundationally be pretty solid without having to go to law school. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, the only thing I'll add in law schools, I mean now especially with all the reports that came out in terms of how difficult it is for people to get jobs out of law school, it's kind of the, the whole law school framework has changed in dramatic ways in the last few years. And especially if you add that burden on top of that, it's definitely something to to keep in mind, right? No, and you're exactly right. And Remember, technology is going to impact the law too, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of the lawyers outside of the big law firms, and it's still impacting the lawyers out of the big law firms, right? The, those documents that you know, the that some of the rural lawyers, uh, su suburban lawyers, right, are you know, are standard forms, and basically they'll give you the options with techno software programs. Uh, so we're legal zoom, right, yeah, that's like yeah. a lot of people out of business right, right now. Right, where you used to get paid five hundred to hundred dollars per person is now you know you buy a software program for fifty bucks, and it's done. So it's the not not discouraging you, right? Just just understand it's it's a challenge. So, and if you want to make money, the it's a, it's a tough right the it's a tough way to do a multiple. So, so wait, I'm sorry, he, he, he had his hand up first. So I'm sorry. Hello, my name is uh, Ruben Rodriguez. I'm a fourth year sociology major, and my uh, aspiration is to one day run for office, whether I love this. The, <laughs> I love this. The local or, or um, federal. And uh, my question is, uh, what, what, what do you want to accomplish as an elected official? Um, to like um, improve policies of of neighborhoods that are not that affluent, how to have better structure, and like be like a, a person that um, people can like, um, if they're voting, that they can entrust and like, be represented. So have like a, a person that will have their good face in, in whatever, um, whether it be local or, or in Congress, like have a person of trust. And so Great. I believe if there's more candor, uh, like you said, people can have faith in, in the political system. And my question is, um, you were speaking about student debt, and um, my question is, um, in New York, I, I believe that um, if a family makes less than $100,000, um, it is now free education, and also in San Francisco, uh, just for San Francisco uh, City College, it's the same, uh, same amount of money if your family makes less than that, is, um, you can go 
free to community colleges, I believe, in San Francisco City. So um, what are some of the positions that California can um, copy or, or um, um, make their own or similar to New York's or, or San Francisco City's um, policies of the potential free college education? So the leadership in the California State Assembly, right, and the, as I mentioned earlier, the great speaker is from this school. Uh, assembly assembly uh, leadership team wants to provide free education for Cal State and UC students with certain conditions, right? So they will have to deliberate further what those free conditions. It doesn't include community college students. Uh, so we'll, we'll wait to see the specifics. So they're gonna uh, ramp it up. So early on, it's, it's, it's gonna cost some money, right? And we have to figure out how to raise that additional money to make sure that we cover it. So I think they're gonna try to find between 300 to $450 million to slide into the program. Fully implemented for the state, it'll be $1.6 billion additional money. Now, I mentioned, right, and people don't get all that excited, but I actually get excited about saving money, right? Yeah. Yeah. right. <laughs> When I say I save $5.3 billion, but remember when I said that earlier? Right, if the state needs $1.6 billion to provide UC students and Cal State students a free education, that's what it turns into, right? I don't, I don't care about saving a dollar for dollar's sake. I care about that dollar for people's lives. Um, in Tennessee, this is what they did for the community colleges, not for their institutions of higher learning. So sort of the same thing. Uh, in Tennessee, you can get free community college but well, you have to do a few things, right? You have to be a full-time student, you have to be on track to graduate, you have to have certain grade, the academic performance, you have to seek federal aid, right? So get all the federal uh, money that you can. Uh, you participate like in service or, I think in service or um, like a work study program, and then the sta state fills in that difference, right? So I don't know, California, that's the model we eventually go to or what it comes up with. But I think that's sort of, right, because we want people invested in their education, so. So we have, um, let's collect three questions because I saw a bunch of hands up. And then so just choose whichever you want, just randomly. And then um, conclude your remarks and then we'll have a reception after so you can talk to okay. the treasurer more. Okay. Hi, my name is Daniel Shields. I'm a first year environmental toxicology major, oh, uh, right. graduate student. Um, so I had a, actually, I just did a couple, couple questions real quick. Um, oh, I guess for a dream, um, increase financial literacy for the general population because we're getting killed out there, yeah. <laughs> literally. And then um, uh, better, cor well my, my goal is to have better correlations between numbers and people and vice versa. So, uh, so a quick question, sixth place that we're at now, is that because the relative rank of everybody else has fallen as well? Or is that because we have out-prospered them as far as we've increased our GDP or whichever metric we're using. Okay, so let's get to, okay, that's a quick answer. Let's get two more questions and oh, we'll come back to them. Uh, couple tier here. What do you okay. say? Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, just Single question rule from now on. All right. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it quickly. I know I give long answers. So California's economy prior to the recession was $2 trillion. During the recession, we went down to $1.9 trillion. Today, we're at $2.46 trillion. So we grew, right? And in your economics lesson, the professor's an expert, right? We all know there's cycles, right? There's business cycles, there's commodity cycles, there's monetary cycles. So early, right, we saw countries like Russia, Brazil, their economies grew dramatically, right? Because you had an economy, when oil prices get high, people want to make money, so they put huge capital investment into growing it, right? They make a lot of money, but at a certain point, right, the, those prices cap, tap out, right, cap out, then they drop, they drop, right, and then their economies go down, right? So we saw, like, the Brazilian economy sluggish, right, the, and other places, and oftentimes they take on too much debt, so it's both. Okay, awesome, and then the last question real quick was the 1.5 million units, is that homes that we need, that we're lacking, or is it affordable homes? That's affordable homes, okay. right, and so that, that's units, so necessary, right, it could be dwelling, condominiums, apartment houses, you got it, yeah, perfect. Excellent, thank you. Yes? My name is uh, Christopher Moffitt, and I have my master's degree in international relations from UC San Diego, uh, but I am from, uh, I'm born and raised in San Bernardino. Very nice. Uh, and so, my, uh, so, as a member of the San Bernardino County Young Democrats, I hear what you're saying about the need for green jobs. I hear from um, 
people in places like Montana where there's increases in cases of asthma. But in my day job at, at the regional office for the California Centers for International Trade Development, uh, I know that the leading job sector of growth in the Inland Empire is logistics uh, mm -hmm. sector, and also advanced manufacturing is starting to take off in the region as well, and there's a push to make it even bigger, which is not always as uh, friendly to the regulations that you <coughs> mentioned in your speech. So my question is, what is your vision for the balance between the air quality that Sanford, uh, that Inland Empire desperately needs and the jobs that are fueling our local economy's growth? Before you answer that, John, let's just take one last question. Sure. And, and then we'll, so whoever you want to. I'm sorry, and did, did I hear your dream? Oh, well, my, <laughs> my apologies. Uh, my no, dream no, I, I, I don't know about uh, short-term memory. <laughs> my dream is uh, to uh, be of benefit to my state and my country by serving in, in government in some form. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you for the um, discussion this afternoon. My name is Andrew Garcia. I'm actually an alumni of UC Riverside, class of 2012. Um, my question is, what's the state of California doing for its pension liabilities. Um, you know he's going to ask you about your dream, so you got to... And my dream... <laughs> is to have a pension? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's long gone, along with being an astronaut, but um, this might sound a bit kiss ashes, but I would love to see you as governor. Oh, thank you. That's fine. So <laughs> we'll leave that as the dream. So, the, uh, so what the state has done in 2012, they passed PEPRA, uh, right? That's the pension reform. The uh, California Today... Uh, our pension live CalPERS, which is the nation's largest public pension plan in the country, is about 68% funded. Cal and that'll drop because we have to ma we change the discount rates, right? So what our it's like the other side, but not precise of what our expected rate of return is. And for uh, CalSTRS, the state teachers retirement system, which is the second largest pension plan in the United States of America, uh, it's. Uh, the, it's about 63.5% funded. So one of the things that we did is we changed the uh, normal costs so both employers and employees have to pay the normal costs where sometimes you didn't have a, a contribution or a mismatch of contribution by the employees. We've increased or allowed others to increase the retirement age uh, for workers and so, and we also changed the benefit allow people to change the bet or change the benefit formula. So like somebody in the past could have gotten two two and a half or three or one and one point eight and we've been able to allow people to reduce uh, the discount rate. Or actually they were allowed to but uh, but it wasn't necessarily done. So what happens is it changed the cost curve. So the cost curve in the past was going to look like this in regards to pension costs. The PEPRA reforms apply to new employees. So beginning January 1st of 2013, so the pension costs look like this, and they start to flatten out 20 years into it. Uh, so we can contain it, and then we will see what we do with current employees, right? So one of the things we're doing with investments is we're dropping the discount rate, because frankly, we just don't want to take as much risk, uh, right? If you look at the history of investment returns, America, when we were, and we're still the number one economy, but by far we were number one by a large, healthy margin. Uh, and it's part of its demographics, right? The United States is 320 million plus. India has over a million people. China has one point uh, over a million, uh, I'm sorry, a billion people. Uh, China has over a billion people. So that means if America is going to be as productive or as productive, we have to be four times as productive, right? And with technology, it's just hard to do that, right? We just want to make sure that we have, we perform the best that we can. We can have a high quality of life, right, per capita, uh, high standard of living. And so that's what we're doing today. Another question. And, and the, the, uh, so we, ha we have to find a good balance, right? So we're going to, obviously, we're going to have to continue to do, and you have some of that through your, I guess, your, uh, Elizabeth, what do you call that center where you're uh, oh, uh, uh, right, where you're doing the, uh, the technology and the entrepreneurship? Oh, Riverside Excite and Riverside Ethics. Those are the two yeah. kind of innovation efforts going on. Right, so part of, part of this is the Andrew Yang wrote a book about startup startups and local communities, right? And so you'll have those types of transformations, right? So hopefully earlier, sooner than later, that we'll have those growth where you can have local activity that produce high returns um, that will displace some of that other economic activity. 
we'll have improvements in those particular sectors, right? Cleaner vehicles, the uh, cleaner buildings, right? Clean, cleaner energy conversion, cleaner energy conveyance. Uh, so hopefully we, we do that research that's done here. We'll do it faster uh, so that we can match uh, the environmental results plus have economic growth. Excellent. Well, please give a, a warm <laughs> thank you to you. busy job that's made even busier by uh, by uh, new relatively new political developments so thank you for taking the thank time uh, and we'd love to uh, talk to you more during the reception Very so good. thanks again for thank coming you. Yeah, to no, thanks for having me. thank you yeah. okay.